live. Good afternoon and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project webinar. My name is Colton Grob. I'm the Deputy Director of RTP. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the guest speakers on today's webinar. If you would like to learn more about each of our speakers and their work, you can visit regproject.org where we have their full bios. After discussion between our panelists, we will go to audience Q&A. So please enter any questions you have into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. This afternoon, we're pleased to host a discussion on the Supreme Court's recent decision in Axon v. FTC, which was consolidated with Cochrane v. SEC, and the implications of the case for administrative law and executive branch agencies. We're very grateful to Russell, who is a partner at Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, for moderating today's conversation. Russell, I'll pass it off to you. Great, thank you, Colton. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is a very exciting case and we have a, a wonderful panel who's going to be joining us. I'll introduce them now and then we will dig in. Um, Peggy Little is Senior Litigation Counsel at the New Civil Liberties Alliance. It's a nonpartisan nonprofit civil rights group whose mission is to protect constitutional freedoms from violations by the administrative state. Uh, she has more than three decades of experience as a trial and appellate litigator. She directed the Federalist Society's Pro Bono Center for many years. She regularly speaks, blogs, and publishes on the constitutional limits of government power. Uh, she's a graduate of the Yale University and Yale Law School and clerked for Judge Winter on the Second Circuit. And maybe most relevant and most important, she represented one of the respondents in, in this case, uh, Michelle Cochran. So Peggy, thanks for joining us. Uh, we will also have Henry Sue, who is a seasoned trial and appellate lawyer who focuses on antitrust, intellectual property, technology, and consumer protection law. He was previously a senior litigator and advisor uh, with the Federal Trade Commission, one of the agencies at issue in this case. Uh, he had a long career in private practice as well. He's currently chair of the Standing Committee on Pro Bono and Public Service at the ABA and is in leadership for the ABA's antitrust law section and he is a graduate of Yale University and UVA. So to so we're going to dive right in. I'm going to just briefly tee up the the case and then we're going to we're going to talk about yeah, what the what the court held and the implications for administrative law for agencies and practitioners. Uh, so I'll just I'll briefly summarize and we'll dive in. Uh, so so this is this case is two cases, as Colton mentioned. Uh, one involved the FTC, one involved the SEC. Uh, they both raised the same issue, though. Uh, in both cases, a regulated person was facing enforcement proceedings by an agency. In both cases, the person believed the agency lacked constitutional authority to proceed with the enforcement proceeding at all. Uh, they argued that the administrative law judges or ALJs in their cases were uh, insufficiently accountable to the president uh, in violation of Article II of the Constitution. One of the parties also argued that the combination of prosecutorial and adjudicati adjudicative uh, powers in the same agency violated due process. And so both of them brought their claims uh, directly to federal district court, uh, but both of them had these claims dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. And the reason was that the agency's orders by statute are reviewable in the courts of appeals. And so the district court held that by implication, their jurisdiction was divested and you couldn't raise these important structural constitutional issues uh, directly in district court. You needed to first go through the agency and then on appeal from a final agency order, then raise it in the court of appeals. And I wanna stop there uh, just so we can get a little bit more of a sense of what this means for regulated parties. Uh, the facts of Ms. Cochran's case, I think are, are particularly helpful to understand what's at stake here. So Peggy, could you talk about the facts of Ms. Cochran's case, what relief you were seeking in district court, why you were seeking it, and, and what her experience tells us about why this issue is important. I'd be happy to, Russell. I think that Justice Gorsuch did a great job of summarizing Michelle's case, and I recommend um, people listening to this uh, uh, webinar to, to take a look at that. But to give you the short version, Michelle Cochran had already gone through one complete administrative hearing. Uh, that got set aside because of a case called Lucia, which is important to understand in this context. And Mr. Lucia in 2018 had objected to the uh, lack of proper appointment of his SEC L ALJ, and he won on that issue in the United States Supreme Court. Here's the conundrum. 
both Mr. Lucia and Ms. Cochran were then forced to go back and be retried by a newly correctly appointed ALJ, but there were still objections to the removal protections. Moreover, and this uh, is something that the Supreme Court did not talk about in the opinion, but it's true, uh, Mr. Lucia had raised the removal protections in his case. Furthermore, the Solicitor General agreed that the removal protections uh, were unduly insulating the ALJs uh, from presidential control in his case, so it would have been a conceded issue had the court reached that issue in 2018. It did not, saying that the lower courts had not reached that issue, uh, so it had no um, lower court record on the removal issue. Um, we we put, sued on Michelle's behalf in federal court because she was in this awful dilemma of having gone through a administrative proceeding once and she would have to go through it again. And if she were right, she'd have to go through it a third time. That is illogical. It makes no sense. It's costly to everyone. She was already seven or probably then six uh, years into the administrative process when uh, we filed her action for her in the uh, district court. We were also representing Ray Lucia as well, and we filed on his behalf in the district court in San Diego. Now, Michelle is a single mom. She was working for the boss from hell, and uh, he tried to make her become his partner with no additional pay, just ex additional exposure. And he was complaining about her taking too long to carefully complete audits. So she did what any self-respecting person would do. She quit her job. And that was in 2013. And all of the issues that she was charged with date from a roughly 2010 to 2013. Three years later, she's astonished to be charged by the SEC for what Justice Gorsuch points out was, was essentially incomplete audit paperwork. And um, the, the proceeding did not go well. Michelle couldn't even get a lawyer to represent her because the lawyers she consulted said they always win in the administrative proceedings. All we will be doing is taking your money and we can't do that. So she goes ahead pro se. What happens? Her boss from hell um, uh, settles and then turns around and testifies against her throws her under the bus for incomplete pa paperwork dating back by that time, you know, anywhere from three to um, three to six years. And, and so she goes through this proceeding and her license to practice as a CPA is suspended. This is a terrible ordeal for anyone to go through and particularly hard for somebody who had uh, had, nobody had ever lost money, claimed fraud, um, there were simply no regulatory damage uh, here having to do with the fact she didn't complete all her audits when she quit because her boss was not just difficult, but as Justice Gorsuch uh, noted, dishonest. So uh, she lost in the district court. Um, at that point, when we filed for Michelle, we had five circuits against us. Uh, we brought her appeal to the Fifth Circuit. We lost two to one uh, with a good dissent. And there had also been a dissent in a similar case in the Second Circuit. Uh, but other than that, all the circuit courts were going against us. We moved for a rehearing en banc. And I argued Michelle's case in January of 2021 before 16 judges on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals who agreed that she should not have to go through yet another unconstitutional proceeding, then uh, be able to bring her constitutional claims before a real court of law that was very likely to set aside the whole thing for a second time. And at that point, she would have been decades into um, administrative proceedings. And so she's stuck. That's that's the issue here. She, she wants to raise this this constitutional claim that the agency can't go forward, but she can't bring it in a court. 
And so she's stuck in the agency for as many years as that process takes. Um, and, and Henry, on the FTC side, if a party goes before an administrative law judge, judge at the FTC, how long can they expect that, that case to take? Um, and are all cases litigated to final action or do people settle? How does that process work? Sure, thank you, Russell. And first of all, uh, apologies to everyone, the audience, the Federalist Society for my delay. I was teaching another program that literally ended at, at two, and then uh, we had people that ran over. So sorry to be a few minutes late, but thank you to the Federalist Society and the Regulatory Transparency Project and Svetlana for inviting me to speak. Now, to answer your question, Russell, I mean, the, the F FTC's uh, rules regarding its adjudicative process are uh, contained in what's called part three of the rules. And, and there are specific timelines for how long an FTC adjudication is supposed to take place. Assuming, you know, the FTC brings a complaint, right? It, it, the intention obviously is to get to a hearing on the merits and ultimately to, you know, through the entire price, you know, process, which could include, you know, a petition for review to a circuit court of appeals. Uh, you know, obviously it's always possible that the case could settle along the way. But if not, it, you know, the intention is that it's gonna go through adjudication. And there are specific timelines, basically for a merger case, if the FTC is also seeking a preliminary injunction in federal district court, then the default, the presumptive timeline for getting to a hearing on the merits from with an, with an administrative law judge is five months. And if there's no preliminary injunction, it's eight months. And then from that, after the hearing, assuming there are findings of fact, proposed findings of fact that are filed with the administrative law judge, the deadline for the initial decision from the administrative law judge is prescribed as well. It's 70 days, so pretty quick. And then from there, if there is an appeal to the full commission, you know, the, full, the, the full commission can have uh, 45 days for a decision, or if there's a preliminary injunction in place, or a hundred days if there's not. So my point though is it's it's pretty abbreviated. And you know, there obviously are procedural guidelines for extending those dates somewhat, but it is pretty abbreviated and a litigant in an FTC case can expect to get to the merits fairly quickly and hopefully avoid the tor you know the tortuous path that Ms. Cochran had to go through with the SEC. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. And, and I guess it's a matter of perspective too for the for the you know client or the the regulated party who who wants to bring their their claim immediately and to to argue that there's a lack of constitutional authority. Even five months can seem like a long time. Uh, you're paying attorneys to be litigating that in a and you're saying that the entire proceeding is unlawful. But that's that's a helpful background context. Thank you both for that. And so now let's talk about the court's opinion. So both cases go up to the Supreme Court. Um, the, the court looks at its precedents and finds three that seem to be most on point. One is, is called Thunder Basin. Uh, in that case, the, the court held that uh, a statutory review scheme that put uh, judicial review of, of an agency's orders in the Court of Appeals did preclude district court jurisdiction over statutory claims and over a constitutional due process claim about the agency imposing a fine before holding a hearing. Another case called Elgin uh, was an equal protection challenge to a, dis to a discharge decision. And the court there also held that that constitutional claim couldn't go immediately to district court. It needed to go through the agency and then to the Court of Appeals. And so the district court's jurisdiction was divested. And then a third case went, went the other way. That was Free Enterprise Fund, uh, where the court held that government officials were insufficiently accountable to the president. And the court also held that that claim did not need to go first through the agency process and then to the Court of Appeals, that the district court had jurisdiction to, to adjudicate that claim in the first instance. And so uh, the court, the court articulated two different ways of approaching its precedents. One was to what, what Justice Kagan called the 30,000 foot view to, to compare, does this case look more like Free Enterprise Fund or look more like Thunder Basin and Elgin? Um, and 
Uh, the other way was to evaluate three factors that the court identified in Thunder Basin uh, to see whether the, the statutory review scheme applied to the claim that was at issue. And those factors were whether uh, precluding district court jurisdiction would foreclose all meaningful review of the claim, whether the claim is wholly collateral to the statute's review provisions, and whether the claim is outside the agency's expertise. The Supreme Court unanimously held that uh, the claims that um, Ms. Cochran brought and that Axon brought were more like free enterprise fund and, and, were, and satisfied the, the Thunder Basin factors, and so the district court had jurisdiction. Um, as I said, Justice Kagan authored that opinion, and there were two concurrences. One was uh, by Justice Thomas making a constitutional argument that we'll talk about in a bit, and then one was by Justice Gorsuch concurring only in the judgment and saying that the Thunder Basin factors in the entire process was convoluted. We'll talk about those in a second, but I want to talk first about um, the scope of the majority opinion written by Justice Kagan. Um, Let's let's start with with these tests. Um, we'll start with you, Peggy. I mean, how should we understand the thirty thousand foot test? You know, looking at the at these um, precedents and seeing which it's most close, which it's most close to, and the Thunder Basin factors. Are these two separate tests? Uh, does satisfying either mean that the claim can go forward? How should we? How do you understand what the court was doing there? Well, the 30,000 foot uh, test is something entirely new. It's not in any lower court decision. Uh, I think it might usefully be seen more as dicta than a new test. Um, but we always thought that this case uh, and that of Axon, in which we had filed amicus briefs, was identical uh, in its context to the Free Enterprise Fund test because it was challenging the very structure of the agency proceeding. It was not fact specific or claim specific and finding out if you were, had to be tried before an administrative law judge that you claimed was unconstitutional was by necessity something that had to be decided before you underwent the proceeding. Now, Justice Kagan goes on to go through all three of the Thunder Basin factors. And with great ease, it is shown that these both parties satisfy those tests. Because if you, uh, I think the, the quote on, um, on the uh, meaningful judicial rule is um, once you've had a proceeding that has already happened, it cannot be undone. So it was a timing problem which we had been struggling with in the lower courts and three circuits on behalf of many clients uh, as well. It's clearly collateral, it's not case specific. And finally on the agency expertise, and this, this gets misquoted a lot and it's important not to do that. In Free Enterprise Fund, they describe the, the test as beyond the agency's competence and expertise. And Administrative law judges just do not have the competence to rule on their own constitutional qualifications to sit. It's a very fundamental point. One of our great amicus in um, Cochrane had, had uh, argued that essentially it was asking a judge whether they should recuse themselves, but obviously they can't be ruling on their own constitutional uh, validity. And in fact, uh, I know of a case in the DEA context where an ALJ did just that. He said, I can't decide whether I'm constitutionally uh, uh, protected from removal um, or unconstitutionally appointed and, and uh, none the, so it went to district court. So it, it seems to us to be a very obvious, obvious thing that in these claims, uh, whether it be a 30,000 foot test or applying all three factors, you get to the same result these claims must be heard in district court before the proceeding happens. Great, thank you, Peggy. Henry, how about you? Do, you? do you see it the same way? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, what I would say is I compliment Justice Kagan's majority opinion, right, for, for taking that 30,000 foot level because, you know, when we did talked about this case last fall, 
and I was reading the lower court's opinions, I found it, frankly, kind of hard to follow the three factors under Thunder Basin, right? I mean, you know, trying to parse what collateral, collateral, collaterality means or what agency expertise means or what meaningful review means. You know, it's just hard to follow. And the truth is, is I think the point is, is you, this is really kind of, if you're gonna use Thunder Basin, that 30,000 foot uh, you know, view is just fine because it's really just like, what's our impression? Of what kind of a claim is this? And is this something that you know, uh, really should you know, be subjected to the, you know, to the standard agency uh, adjudicative process or not? And so I think that 30,000 foot view suffices if you're going to you know, apply Thunder Basin, although you know, as we saw in the opinion, you know, even the, the granular, granular analysis makes sense. And I think, I think so. I think you know, I agree that the, the result is the result. I think we all expect it. Yeah, that, that's helpful. Thank you. And yeah, and, and you know, to your point on the granular test, there's, there's still a question about what happens if the factors point in different ways. The court suggests that it may still come out the same way and that, and that you could still end up with district court jurisdiction. Um, but it, it points to the fact that that 30,000 foot view approach is, is just simpler and, and may end up leading you to the same result that you would be be at after the Thunder Basin factors. Um, Peggy, I want to come back to you. So we have these two tests. What claims, what types of claims do you think are going to satisfy these? Obviously, in, the, in this case, we had the two that I mentioned. There's a, a removal, for cause removal um, challenge, and there's also the consolidation of uh, adjudicative and prosecutorial functions in the same agency, which was framed as a due process claim. But what what other claims do you think might be able to go forward? I think that, um, and there's a case uh, called Jarcacy, which is working its way up. It's on a cert petition now. It would also include jury trial, Seventh Amendment violations uh, if, if these uh, proceedings uh, violate uh, delegation. Uh, uh, claims that this is, in fact, Article 2 uh, executive branch officers performing Article 3 judicial functions, and that violates the separation of powers and is not within the capacity of an Article 2 uh, officer. Great. Thank you. Henry, any, anything else you would add to that? No, I mean, I I think, you know, there are going to be a number of theories that fit within this, you know, rubric of, okay, we're challenging the constitutionality of the, either the agency structure or the, you know, the adjudicative or enforcement process, you know, and, and certainly if you read uh, Justice Thomas's, you know, concurrence, he gives any, a, a, you know, a variety of arguments that litigants can now make you know, in the first instance in a federal district court. So yes, that's what I would say about that. Yeah, thank you. Very helpful. And and I mean, I think there's there's some room for creativity here, right? And and to to see what courts are going to accept. One, you, you could imagine non-delegation challenges being raised, um, appropriations clause challenges being raised under the same type of uh, rubric. And I, and there's an open question about whether you know certain types of statutory claims might even fit uh, ones that really go to the fundamental authority of the agency um, as as opposed to a minor interpretive issue. Uh, if if the agency is barred from proceeding by statute, might that fit in the same in the same bucket? It, it'll be interesting to see how the courts uh, work out these claims. Uh, another another question is uh, what agencies will it, it apply to? Obviously, the this decision involved the the FTC and the SEC, uh, but many other agencies are subject to similar judicial review mechanisms that place review of the final order directly in the courts of appeals. Uh, that that would include the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, the Federal Communications Commission, um, FERC, the Surface Transportation Board. There's there's others as well. Um, it would seem that that the same types of uh, 
types of claims could be raised in that context as well, because those those review provisions operate similarly, at, at least in the absence of some agency specific reason why a district court couldn't exercise jurisdiction. Um, before we move on from the majority, I, I just want to Ask, does anything about the decision surprise you? We'll start with you, Peggy. Does anything about the decision surprise you? Well, I was pleasantly surprised by the unanimity, uh, although the oral argument had 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 made it clear that that was a possibility. I think there was not a lot of uh, questions um, that would suggest a different outcome that seemed to you know hit home. Or that uh, the solicitor general seemed to have, uh, you know, convinced uh, the court on. I was also surprised by um, the strong language right at the beginning uh, of the decision. Justice Kagan says uh, the challenges here are fundamental, even existential. They maintain, in essence, that the agencies, as currently structured, um, are unconstitutional. And I think that's a very uh, broad statement. I think it endorses how important it is to get these separation of powers and constitutional limitations uh, discovered. And I was pleased to see that in a majority opinion. Yeah, very, very interesting language and, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in future cases as well. Thanks. Henry, how about you? Does anything about the decision surprise you? Not really, because I think, you know, I had always looked at this as really purely procedural, right? It's just, you know, it, it, either it's because you're applying Thunder Basin to get into federal district court, or if you accept Justice Gorsuch's view, it's just 1331 to get you there. So either way, the whole point is you get there. And we don't need to, you know, agree on what theories work or don't work to agree that, you know, parties who are, you know, faced with some sort of agency action should be able to go to a federal district court to challenge the constitutionality of the, of the structure of the agency or the, pro, the adjudicative process. And, you know, again, it's going to be up to the courts then the Article Three judges to decide whether these arguments work or, or don't work. And, you know, and we all have our opinions about which ones may work or not, but it's something that I think they should be allowed to do. Yeah, yeah, and and certainly, you know, to go back to the point about the thirty thousand foot, the claims here look a lot like like what happened in Free Enterprise Fund, and so I think that goes to what you were saying that that the outcome here maybe wasn't too much of a surprise, although to Peggy's point, maybe the unanimity was. Mm -hmm. um, Let's turn to the concurring opinions. We've alluded to them a few times now. Um, Peggy, would you mind telling us about Justice Thomas's concurrence um, and, and what did he say and how do you see it having a real world impact on challenges to agency authority? Sure. He said, and I, this is gonna be a quote, I have grave doubts about the constitutional propriety of Congress vesting administrative agencies with primary authority to adjudicate core private rights with only deferential judicial review on the back end. He calls this, and he gives it a name, it's the appellate review model. It does appear in many statutory uh, review schemes, um, and he uh, lists a number of deficiencies that he thinks these uh, claims uh, present. Uh, they include uh, that it might violate the separation of powers by placing adjudicatory power um, in, within the authority of Article II agencies. Uh, it violates Article III by compelling the judiciary to defer to administrative agencies, um, uh, violating the judicial vesting clause. Uh, it may violate due process by empowering entities that are not courts of competent jurisdiction to deprive citizens of their core private uh, rights. And finally, they may run afoul of the Seventh Amendment by allowing an administrative agency to adjudicate core private rights without a jury. Those are um, very live questions right now, very important uh, to Americans' civil liberties. Uh, the current uh, scheme, in my opinion, uh, 
uh, strips people of due process and jury trial rights. Uh, and we need to return to the courts so that these private rights are adjudicated by those who are independent and unbiased. Great, thank you. And and do you think that this is that that this tees up? I mean, you, you mentioned this is a live issue. Is it, is this something litigants are going to be you know continuing to raise and and to press and maybe even in these uh, in in the Axon context of going going into a district court? You know, these are these are live issues. You're saying that that you expect people to continue to re, to be raising in in real cases. Absolutely, the jury trial of the. Uh, unconstitutional delegation of, of legislative, or excuse me, of adjudicative power. I mean, one way to look at this is Congress does not have adjudicative power, so it's not power it has to delegate to uh, an executive branch agency in the first place. The founders said when it comes to core private rights, and those are pertain to life, liberty, and property, those issues must be adjudicated before a judge who sits in a separate branch of government, government and who has the constitutional protections uh, uh, and is sitting in a court that gives people the protections of a jury trial, of the rules of evidence, of the rules of civil procedure. I mean, Henry talked about the fact that the uh, uh, administrative adjudications are quick. Actually, that's it's a very problematic thing because the investigations go on for years, sometimes many years before people are charged. Then they are given a very short time uh, to respond. And then the agency can sit on their claims forever. And uh, in Michelle's case, she has waited uh, a, a great deal of time. In Ray Lucia's case, it took him six years to get to uh, judicial review and then he, his, by winning at the Supreme Court, his prize was to go back and do it all over again. And I think the most important thing that uh, I hoped to, and I think I did convey to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals on the uh, en banc hearing was how long people were trapped in these administrative mazes. Um, uh, Jar George Jarkis, he was, was seven years. Uh, Michelle Cochran uh, going on seven years. Uh, Ray Lucia was six years. Uh, there's a, a litigant named Bandemir, 10 years. I mean, no one would ever think that it was constitutional or even proper to require people to go through a decade, up to a decade of litigation in administrative courts before a tribunal that isn't even constitutional in the first place. Great, thank you. And, and Russell, if I might yeah. say, you know, just hearing what Peggy just said, there's a question in the chat that gets to this very point, right, about the, the protracted investigation. So, Peggy, do you want to address that? Yeah, I, I think that the, um, I'm going to read to you from a great amicus. This, this yeah. is not my writing, it's somebody else's, but it was terrific. The result is the, is the worst of both worlds for respondents. They're hurried through the administrative hearing process with less time to prepare than if the same proceeding were held in district court and then forced to remain in limbo for more time than if the same action was filed in district court. And that was something that was noted at oral argument. In addition, the, the uh, uh, investigating agency has had years to make its case. And very often it does something uh, we call a document dub which puts years of, of documents of discovery before um, the uh, charged respondent. And the respondent only has months, a very brief period of time to uh, put his or her case together. And so the, um, uh, the asymmetries of power and time between the charged person and the enforcement agency are dramatic and dramatically unfair. Great, thanks. And, and for the record, that's responding to a question about the big picture impact of agency habits of stretching out these investigations. Um, and the, the questioner noted could even turn the process itself into a into a persecution. So thank you uh, for responding to that. Um, Henry, let, let's turn to Justice Gorsuch's concurrence. Uh, 
he he concurred only in the judgment. He didn't join the majority opinion. He called the Thunder Basin factors, quote, a, a roller coaster with twists and turns. I don't know if he had in mind uh, the Thunder Mountain Railroad at Disneyland or something, something else. These are the important questions that court watchers ask. But what's do you share his assessment? Is Thunder Basin this this difficult to apply? Uh, and and what does it say about how courts and practitioners are going to approach these cases if if he's right about that? Yeah, I mean, I do think it's difficult to apply. I actually, you know, agree you know, for the most part with Justice Gorsuch's concurrence. Uh, I think that jurisdiction should shouldn't be a hard question, right? Uh, you know, Congress has the power to define the original jurisdiction of the federal district courts, and you know, given that they have 1331, it should be incumbent on Congress to spell out specific cases in other statutes where the district courts don't have that jurisdiction. And what Thunder Basin essentially is, is, okay, Congress is silent, but did they do so by implication? How do we figure that out? Right? And that's that roller coaster that Justice Gorsuch is talking about. And I think it'd be far easier to just tell Congress, if you want to tell us that lit litigants can't go to federal district court with this question, then do that. Put that in the statute. It's, it's that easy, right? Um, you know, so I, I, I tend to agree with Justice Gorsuch. I, if, if I were a district judge, I would prefer not to have to apply Thunder Basin. Yeah, very, very helpful. And and it is interesting to wonder why why the majority just didn't adopt that rule. Um, and and whether Justice Gorsuch's view might have legs in the future. I I I suppose that the reason they didn't go that far was because it would have, you know, his his view is in, in some tension with Thunder Basin and, and Elgin. And so maybe their majority thought there was no need to go there to, to limit or overrule those cases if you can reach the same result by applying the Thunder Basin factors. But it does raise an interesting question about whether the justices will be interested in that view later, whether it can be implemented by lower court rulings without uh, without running afoul of, of Thunder Basin in these other cases. So I do think it's that's an issue to watch as we're going forward. So thank you both. Um, and that, that kind of leads us to our last section of questions here on, on just the future implications of the ruling. Uh, Peggy, as you noted, the, the decision was unanimous as, as to the results, and it was authored by Justice Kagan. Is there anything sig significant about those, those facts? What does that tell us about the current court? I think the court is attuned to um, agencies getting beyond their regulatory guardrails. Um, there was also a statement very early on in the, in the decision in which Justice Kagan said, the SEC is here to essentially um, ensure honest markets and the FTC to promote fair uh, and uh, competition. And each, those were um, obvious, obvious things to say, but it certainly brought West Virginia versus EPA to mind. And in, in, uh, it seemed to uh, be a court that is trying to remind agencies not to go beyond their guardrails, whether in this case, they're uh, exercising adjudicative powers that they don't have. But I think it, it has some implications for agencies reaching beyond what Congress has asked them to do going beyond their organic commission to uh, regulate. So I think that's a, a very helpful uh, um, bit of language. And I also think going back to uh, the Justice Gorsuch thing, I like to think he uh, pulled the plug on and drained uh, Thunder Basin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and as someone who has argued it in, San Diego District Court in the Ninth Circuit in the Northern District of Texas and the Fifth Circuit twice in the Eleventh Circuit and on uh, on uh, trying to get on banc and in the cert petition and then through Michelle's um, uh, on banks and uh, and the uh, Court of Appeals. I can tell you, I've read every case that tried to apply 
uh, Thunder Basin. It is inconsistently applied. One of the things Justice Alito pointed out in oral argument is, well, what happens if one of the factors is satisfied but not the other two? Which one's more important? And the lower courts um, just toss these things around like um, uh, balls, but they, if the, 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 they're juggling. But they all seem to um, want to reach the very easy conclusion that you'll dump, a, dump the case on the agency. And I think uh, this has been a great reminder of the fact that 1331 confers jurisdiction on district courts to hear constitutional questions. And when jurisdiction is conferred on a court, it is required to hear the case. Yeah, the language, you know, shall rather than may, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very helpful. Thank you. It does. It does suggest that this that the current court, as you said, is the, this decision suggests the court is very vigilant about um, yeah keeping agencies uh, accountable to um, constitution and 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 statutes and yeah it, it's it's kind of another brick in that wall that the court has been laying. Uh, before I ask Henry another question, just a reminder to the audience, feel free to submit questions through the Q&A portal. Um, we're going to open it up for some questions here in just a minute. So uh, if you have any, please uh, submit those. Uh, in the meantime, Henry, the, the FTC can choose to bring enforcement actions either before the agency or they can go to, to district court, right? Do, do you think Axon's going to affect that choice? Uh, and, and more broadly, what, is this, what does the decision mean for the future of FTC litigation and enforcement? Well, so what I would say to you is, I think let's, you know, sticking with just the Axon case, right, which is a merger case, this has been a recurring question over the years is why doesn't the FTC challenge mergers in federal district court the same as the antitrust division? And indeed, when I was at the, at the commission as a trial lawyer, we did just that. We challenged you know, a hospital physician group merger in Idaho. And so we appeared before an article to re-judge in Boise, Idaho, and got persuaded that judge to see it our way and to break up the, the combination. So it, it, it can be done. And of course, there's been proposed legislation, uh, for instance, from Senator Lee uh, under the title, the Smarter Act, which would basically make the, make the process the same, right? So, you know, if, I think if you're the FTC, at least as far as mergers are concerned, I don't think it makes that much of a difference to have to do exactly what the antitrust division does, to have the same set of enforcement powers and remedies, same procedures, same jurisdiction, do exactly what they do. And then, you know, I mean, a, a, be, a public benefit is then there's no kind of rolling the dice. Oh, am I gonna get the D DOJ this time or am I gonna get an FTC this time? It's the same, either way, it, same issues, same process. So, you know, that, I guess that's what I would say about that. Um, Thanks. That's that's very helpful, and and it seems like a win-win, right? That the the litigants are going to get the benefit of of being in court, and and the FTC doesn't have to to worry about these kind of collateral challenges. Do you agree with that, Henry? And then Peggy, I didn't mean to cut you off. We'll come right back to you. No, I I agree with you. I mean, now I have I purposely limited my comment to you know to merger litigation, merger enforcement, because I think that's where we have another agency, namely the antitrust division, that's doing something different. And so again, this idea of aligning the processes makes a lot of sense to me. Obviously, there is another set of work that the FTC gets into where, you know, I mean, it was Congress's vision that the administrative adjudicative process might have certain benefits because it would allow the agency to, you know, basically, you know, uh, bring to bear its expertise in certain areas in, in unfair methods of competition. And, and so that's another area where I, I don't think, I think it's a little, it's a lot harder to say, well, what about that? You know, why, why sh should we dispense with that? 
you know, and and indeed in axon, axon's motion, you know, uh, the constitutional arguments were actually addressed by the commission. Right? So there is actually an opinion by the commission where the commission basically comes out, and it was a unanimous opinion. I think Commissioner Slaughter did not participate, but it was you know four zero with both Republicans and Democrats uh, concluding the same thing. But basically, they said, look, this isn't free enterprise. Free enterprise is about PCAOB, which is very different from our ALJs who strictly have an adjudicative role, right? And that and that adjudicative role, that, that's actually by design because that addresses that other argument about a, you know, a single agency being both prosecutor, judge, and jury, right? Because you have an independent ALJ who does nothing but looks at the evidence, you know, issues rulings, procedural rulings, conducts the hearing and issues an initial decision. You have a separate team within the agency that acts as complaint counsel. And then you have finally the full commission that reviews the initial decision and ultimately is accountable for what that's gonna be, right? And that, that was the commission's argument about the double, you know, cause for cause tenure issue, right? Ultimately, it's that, you know, presidentially appointed, congressionally confirmed commission that is responsible for the, you know, the decision that comes out of the commission. Yeah, so, thanks. Yeah, Peggy, I, I think you were going to chime in there. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go no ahead. No problem. Um, here's, here's my problem with the um, in-house agency adjudications. The FTC hasn't lost before its own ALJs in 25 years. It has a 100% win rate, and the SEC is, is in the 90%. Uh, this is very different than the rates of uh, success in the district courts, and I think that targets of, of enforcement are rightfully wary as to whether they are getting a fair shake in the, uh, in the administrative courts. As far as um, Henry noting that the, the uh, ALJs reach the constitutional questions, I go back to the um, ALJ who said, hey, I can't decide on my own power to sit. Um, and the Free Enterprise Fund talks about that. It's, is the ALJ competent? Do they have the competence and expertise? And they have, as Justice Kagan points out, no special competence in separation of powers jurisprudence. In fact, they don't have the power to rule upon uh, that at all. Um, I would also point out that um, in Ray Lucia's case, it was really interesting to see how the commission ruled. Um, they, uh, he, he took his case through to the five member SEC, two members dissent, and, and they dissented for two reasons. One, his ALJ, who was someone who bragged that he always ruled in, the, in favor of the commission, and that's the same uh, judge that Michelle had, that he had made up a rule out of whole cloth in the agency enforcement. And this is a real genuine concern that the ALJs um, and, and the specific language in a uh, race case was under the meaning of back tests that I have found today, Ray Lucia has violated the securities laws. Well, that's retrospective regulation and it's totally unacceptable. And the two dissenting commissioners not only pointed that out, but also pointed out that nobody, uh, none of the five had competence to rule on a constitutional question. And finally, uh, one of the things that has uh, not received a lot of discussion because it's still uh, being litigated uh, in, in Michelle's case is uh, right as Michelle's case was being uh, considered for cert, uh, the SEC filed uh, a notice of control deficiency noting that enforcement staff had accessed agency adjudicators' files. Um, and uh, that was also filed in George Jarkissi's case. NCLA has a FOIA uh, case going against the SEC in the DC uh, District Court We've, uh, because in the FOIA process, they would give us no information about this. And so what you always suspect and fear that when your prosecutor 
is also your judge's employer happened. They were sharing files. So um, the concern about impartiality and bias is very real, it's very documented, and the SEC has been anything but forthcoming about the facts behind those control deficiencies. If, I'm, yeah, if I may, Russell, I just want to respond quickly to uh, Peggy. Let me Great. clarify what happened in Axon. I, I, you know, in Axon, the ALJ actually entered an order saying, I'm not qualified to decide the constitution, constitutionality of my own position. So it was the, the motion was teed up to the full commission, and it was the full commission that issued that opinion that I'm referring to. Right. And I guess what I'm saying here is I'm not suggesting that post-Saxon litigants don't have the ability to raise this constitutional question in the federal district court in the first instance. But I'm saying that at least if you look at the commission's opinion in Axon, it concludes that at least the way, the way it looked at it, this is different. The ALJ structure is different from PCAOB and free, and free enterprise. That's all I'm saying. And obviously, a federal district judge could disagree with that. There's another um, really interesting thing that the Axon case presented that the Cochrane case did not, and that is that the FTC was trying to force Axon, uh, which, by the way, Axon abandoned the merger, but they were trying to force Axon to give over its intellectual property to the company that it uh, is, was now a, co a competitor. And... Uh, that, that's beyond the agency's power to do. And footnote four of Justice Gorsuch's opinion talks about the troubling fact that when so many people settle before agencies, they enter into consent decrees that sometimes the agency is get, gets them to agree to give uh, up something that they could never have won at trial. That's very disturbing that agencies are expanding their remedies, whether it be disgorgement, which is a hot topic, or whether it be surrendering your intellectual property to a, uh, a company that you tried to acquire and then agreed you would not acquire, um, or uh, in, in uh, some related, religion, uh, related litigation that we do, uh, gag orders, uh, where in which you agree you will never speak uh, negatively about the um, SEC's case against you. That's something that the agency has no power to win at trial, and they admit it. Great, thank you. We, we had a question in the chat that I want to pose to both of you, if you're able to answer it. It was a question about the win rate at the FTC. The question is, isn't the win rate at the FTC 100% because the commissioners have the power to overturn the ALJs, and they use that power, so there's no real independence in the ALJs. The commenter mentions Lab MD, which got um, thunder basined, as it were, by the 11th Circuit um, and was was kept in court. But does, does either of you have a uh, have a view on that? Is, is that part of the win rate percentage that you kind of have two levels of, of review? And so the ALJs end up getting overruled by the commission? I'll say that I, I don't have the win rate quote or stat in front of me firmly, so I'm not sure what it is exactly. But to respond to the, the comment or the questioner, yes, it's true. It's true that you know the way the process works at the FTC is you have an initial decision from the ALJ based on the, you know, the evidentiary hearing which then is subjected to review by the commission. And so the commission obviously can affirm, adopt, modify, overturn, and it has overturned. Uh, most recently, there was the uh, decision, you know, the adjudication in Illumina Grail, where uh, the ALJ uh, you know, decided against the complaint council, but the commission recently issued an opinion overturning that. So yes, they, they do disagree. And so I'm not sure when we talk about win rate, whether we're really talking about the win rate at the ALJ 
level or at the commission level. I'm, not, I'm just not, I don't have that. I'm not going to be able to comment on that. Well, I have, I have an observation to make about the commission level of review because the commission has to vote to prosecute somebody in the first place. Okay, so they, they, they all, all agree that this person should be prosecuted. Then they are prosecuted before an ALJ who's an employee of the commission. And then the first level of appeal is to the commission that thought they should be prosecuted in the first place. I think it's no wonder that Americans feel like they're in a kangaroo court. Great, thank you. Uh, we are we are running up on time, so I'm going to put one more question to both of you, and it's this: What is an important takeaway for practitioners from from this case? What for those who are in the practice of law who are representing clients before agencies? What's what's a takeaway for them? If if you want, I go first, but I'm just going to steal from Peggy, which is that. <laughs> You know, Great. I do think that the, the 9 0 decision signals that, you know, this court is very receptive to questions about the constitutionality of our, you know, administrative state. And so the only way those questions get up to the court is if they're heard below. And so this, the point, this, you know, the lesson here is whatever arguments you want to make, you can make them, you can bring them, you know, bring them before a federal district court. I agree, and I think that uh, if I, you're a practitioner with a client, uh, you need to be very vigilant to be sure that they are getting before the tribunal that will offer them the most constitutional and fairest uh, adjudication. And I think that it's uh, uh, incumbent upon practitioners to uh, review whether uh, this is a case that a jury might see differently. I mean. If you read Justice Gorsuch's uh, recitation of Michelle Cochran's case, I think there's little doubt that a jury might have ruled other uh, in a different fashion than the ALJ did. And so I think practitioners need to be attentive to the constitutional due process and jury trial rights of their clients. Great, thank you. Um, I, and the only thing I would I would add is that you know that. The court's opinion doesn't foreclose the ability to continue raising these structural challenges in the agency and court of appeals. So certainly if it's advantageous, and I think many clients will want to bring those structural challenges in in district court and, and do that, but also practitioners might want to be you know, cognizant that you still want to preserve your your arguments before the agency in case you you end up deciding you want to take those up on appeal through the ordinary review mechanism as well. Um, but thank you both so much. It's been a great discussion. I think it's a, it, as we said, it's a major case, and and the full implications are going to be developed over the course of the next few years. But this is an exciting time to be in administrative law. So thank you, Peggy and Henry, for for joining us, and thanks to the Federal Society for hosting us. Uh, Colton, I will turn it back over to you. Peggy, Henry, and Russell, we are especially grateful. Uh, for you all for your time today and for the insightful discussion on this important issue. Uh, a special thank you to Henry who managed to squeeze us into his busy schedule today. We really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you in the audience who joined the conversation midway through, you can watch the recording via YouTube or listen to it via our podcast feed, which is available everywhere you listen to podcasts. We welcome listener feedback by email at rtp at regproject.org. Thank you all for joining us. This concludes today's discussion. Thank you.